My name is Ted Newman, and I want to thank the organizers greatly um, for naming this conference after me. I, it wasn't necessary, but I do appreciate it. <laughs> uh, I want to tell you something in 10 minutes about 22 centuries uh, of activities. The story has several aspects. First of all, it's a fascinating story in its own right. It gives you a bit of history and it also car carries a wonderful mor moral tale to it, which we will point out at the end, but it's basically the dangers of certainty. Uh, the story begins with Euclid about 300 years uh, BC. Euclid took all the known geometric observations from different people before him and organized them into 13 volumes called Euclid's Elements. This was a logical system. It begins with a series of postulates, and then from the postulates, assumptions or postulates, and then from that, he derives theorems. Um, we're going to concentrate on one single sentence, one single sentence in 13 volumes of Euclid's Elements. I want to start off by just mentioning the five starting postulates that you, you, Euclid used. Uh, I'm not going to give you all the details of them. I'm just going to give you two illustrations. They're obvious statements. Uh, a straight line segment can be drawn joining any two points. Then there are two other obvious statements, and the fourth postulate is all right angles are the same. How could anybody disagree with any of that? The problem became more severe with the fifth postulate. The fifth postulate is called the parallel postulate, and it led to 20 centuries of fighting arguments and discussions. Euclid himself seems to have understood that there was a problem with the uh, parallel postulate. Uh, the parallel postulate was much more complicated than the first four postulates. Let me just read it to you very, very quickly. If two lines are drawn which intersect a third line in such a way that the sum of the inner angles on one side is less than two right angles, then the two lines inevitably must intersect each other on that side if extended far enough. You see, it's a much more complicated uh, postulate than the, first, than the first four. It's much easier to understand pictorially. We have two lines. We have two lines that are cut by a third line. And if the two angles A and B add up to less than 180 degrees, then the original two lines must intersect at some point if extended far enough. It becomes a, 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 a simple uh, thing to understand. Um, but immediately, it was considered, you heard me read it, how complicated it was when you read it. It was immediately understood to be a very, very cumbersome and ugly uh, postulate. And very soon thereafter, it became a firm orthodox belief that the fifth postulate was not an independent postulate, that it could be derived from the first four postulates. Uh, there were many, many attempts to prove the fifth postulate. Uh, the proofs, the attempts came from all countries, all sorts of different cultures. It was really a remarkable uh, history of, of the attempts to prove the parallel postulate from the first four postulates. They were all wrong. All the proofs were wrong. But I just want to illustrate uh, the, the nature of, of, of the attempts. Uh, here's a few names. And I emphasize that each was wrong. Uh, we had Ptolemy and Proclus, Greek mathematicians. We had Whitlow, a Polish mathematician. We had Johann Lambert, a Swiss mathematician. Uh, Levi Ben Gerson was a Talmudic scholar from France. Uh, Borelli, Italian. John Wallace, English. There was a man named Klugel that produced 28 independent proofs of the parallel postulate that were all wrong. That was his dissertation. They gave him a PhD. Probably the most fascinating and interesting of all the proofs or the uh, discussions came from the great Persian poet Omar Khayyam, the poet famous for the Rubaiyat. He was a polymath. Uh, he was an expert. He was probably the greatest astronomer of his period. Uh, he was a mineralogist. Uh, uh, he was a philosopher. He was a writer. He was a poet. Um, he was even a composer. Uh, he wrote this book, Explanations of the Difficulties of the Postulates of Euclid. 
And he came closest to understanding that the fifth postulate was an independent thing. He never said it explicitly, but he just avoided. He showed all the previous proofs were wrong, and he just avoided a serious discussion of it. But he did a lot of work that was influential much, much later. And then he had his uh, follower, Tusi. Uh, this, he wrote a book, Discussion, which removes doubt about parallel lines. And then we have the slightly sad story of the great philosopher Schopenhauer, who did not seem to understand the nature of a logical system. Uh, and he said, <laughs> I, I'm serious, he, he actually said, the postulate is evident by perception. Are you just missing the point of a logical system? Uh, and then the great Kant uh, didn't seem to be interested in the parallel postulate at all. He thought that God geometrizes according to uh, Euclid's elements and you didn't have to prove anything. Uh, the story changed rather dramatically the turn of the, into the early 1700s by an Italian Jesuit priest, Girolamo Saccheri. He assumed, he assumed that the fifth postulate was not true, and he discovered a new geometry. It was really a new geometry, and to the present day, it's now called hyperbolic geometry or sometimes Lobachevsky geometry. Saccheri wrote several books on this, the books were called uh, Euclid Freed from All Flaws. He had this, and at the end of these volumes, he said that this new geometry was so repugnant, the quote is, it is repugnant to the nature of straight lines that his assumption could not possibly be true, and therefore the fifth, fifth postulate was true. I want you to understand that this is an absolutely incredible story that here was one of the men, men who would have been one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, that he broke through 20 centuries of blindness, and he was totally blind himself. He had something in his hand, and he said it was false because it was repugnant. Uh, that is an abject lesson in the dangers of orthodoxy. And then we turn into the, uh, 18, the uh, 1800s, where suddenly all over Europe, it was suddenly understood what was going on. It being that the fifth postulate was an independent postulate and could not be proved from the first uh, four postulates. The first man to really <laughs> grapple with this was the great Gauss, prince of mathematicians, probably the greatest mathematician of all time. Incidentally, there's just the characters in this story are just fabulous characters. Every one of them deserves a novel. Uh, uh, Gauss would not publish his work on this. He told it to friends. Whoops, two minutes left me. He told it to friends, and uh, he said, don't, don't publish this, don't tell anybody. I don't want to get involved with, I gotta speak faster, faster, faster. I, uh, <laughs> I don't want to get in fights with Gauss. And then there was Bolya, a Hungarian uh, genius uh, who never published a single thing in his lifetime because uh, he was so upset that Gauss had beat him to, uh, to the discovery of, of uh, these non-Euclidean geometries. And then there, Lobachevsky, a Russian made famous by Tom Lehrer in his famous songs uh, from Harvard. Uh, non-Euclidean geometry was then born. Uh, I have to mention Bernard Riemann, who was Gauss's great student, who would probably have been Gauss's equal as the greatest mathematician if he had not died young of tuberculosis. He invented a whole series of new geometries called Riemannian geometry. Uh, they included all the previous known geometries, and they opened the quest they opened the realm of what is the real geometry of our physical universe. Uh, we go on to then the 20th century. We're skipping an awful lot, you realize that. <laughs> uh, with Einstein, with his special theory of relativity, where he used the geometry of a Swiss mathematician, uh, Minkowski, uh, special theory of relativity, which describes how th uh, moving objects shrink, how time slows down for moving objects. It describes power via e equals mc squared. Uh, it became the dominant theory for several years. It is a main theory right now. It's based on this new geometry called Minkowski geometry. And then 10 years later, Einstein invented the general theory of relativity. The general theory of relativity is the theory of gravity. It is the theory of the geometry of our world. It has been tested many, many times. It is the geometry of our world. It is certainly the geometry of our cosmos, cosmology. 
contemporary cosmology is based completely on Einstein's theory of general relativity. The Big Bang, the expansion of the universe, uh, that all comes out of Einstein's theory. This brings our journey almost to an end. I have one or two comments to make. One is that we have here a moral tale. Here was something that for 20 centuries was certain every leading intellectual believed that the fifth postulate came from the first four postulates. And it took the period of enlightenment for them to break through that. Uh, it's a moral for right now. When you hear a scientist talk about, we know, don't trust it. Turn it into something like, we think we know. The present theory is this. We hear stories that quantum mechanics is true. We hear about dark matter is true. Probably it is all true, but don't take it as a fixed thing. We also can turn that into politics. Uh, if a politician tells you that lowering the income tax for rich, rich people, you don't have to buy, buy it. Uh, that it's good for the country if you lower the income tax for, for, for taxes for rich people. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily true, okay? Uh, the journey comes to an end, and I just show you, <laughs> I show you a picture of M.C. Escher, Euclidean ge uh, hyperbolic geometry, and all the great men. <laughs> <laughs>